This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Darawal people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I just feel people are happy to be there, and there's a real pleasure in spending time at a restaurant. And I think, you know, particularly. I'm really grateful to front of house staff and, you know, that are dealing with um, customers and it's a real joy um, having those conversations. This is the Over the Glass podcast. I'm Shante Whale. New Year's Eve celebrates the closing of one year and the welcoming of another. The possibilities, the dreams and new hopes. It all comes together to create an atmosphere and anticipation and excitement. Whether you spend it with your work colleagues, family, friends or strangers, it's a time for toasting and looking skyward to the future. Elizabeth Hewson is Head of Creative at Fink, published author and totally responsible for making mouths drool all over her home cooking. With her thirst for knowledge and learning, Lizzie has a vast repertoire of experiences that would make any foodie envious. Hi Lizzie, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. How are you going in the crazy silly season at the moment? (sighs) I, I feel like I'm limping to the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy and I can totally feel that sentiment. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going to happen on the 31st of December, but I'm hoping for a really clean break <laughs> and then poof, a new year, new, new, what do they say, new you? No, new year, new you. You me. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. And I just, you're right. You don't know what to expect after the t- couple of years we've had. And, you know, we always say New Year's off with a bang, but I kind of feel like, oh, just a, a gentle kind of finish would be really nice because we're all, like you said, a little wounded after the last couple of years. What are your plans for New Year's Eve this year? So we're taking it very easy. I mean, we do have a bit of a tradition. Um, I live in Erskineville, which is a suburb of the inner west, and we have quite a few friends. It's a real community vibe. And we actually house hop. So we do a course at each house around the street. There's three houses. And uh we're not actually doing that this year because we're renovating. We're, that's the other thing I'm just adding to the end of the year is to move out of our house. Um, and another friend's just moved around the corner. So we're going to be put there and um, enjoy a long, leisurely meal. Wow. I remember last year when you did that little house hop and I just remember thinking that's a genius idea. And I actually saw somebody else kind of take your idea, like a lot of your ideas, and then um, – recreated as well so I mean was it was that really quite hectic or did it work really well so the first year worked really well because we got the starter so our little we live in a tiny terrace and they it opens up to a back park so we did um you know uh, cocktails um and a few snibbles at our snacks and then we moved on to the next house for the first course so that was really easy last year (laughs) I drew the short straw and I got the midnight shift which is midnight till when everyone's ended and I'm I mean, for me, nothing good happens past midnight. So <laughs> I, I found that the real, the difficult shift. And um, I think I piped as soon as the, the fireworks um, ended. And no one wants to eat at that time. And for me, like cooking's my love language and just felt like, yeah. So this year it, it'll be good. We'll be able to all bring a plate and, um, yeah, not no one gets a short straw. <laughs> That's perfect. And I, I, I agree with you. The fireworks are great, but then sometimes after New Year's, it is all downhill from there. 
What are your tips for surviving till the fireworks? I know a lot of people just think that that's way too late. (laughs) Oh, look, it is. And now that I've got Louis, who's 21 months, my son, um, yeah, midnight is a real stretch. And to be perfectly honest, you know, it's, yeah, sometimes I won't quite make it there. I have hopes for this year and my tips would be a well paced meal and so something that is you know can people can graze over the night and that brings you know you back to the table um and and good booze of course (laughs) of course 101 (laughs) yeah a little pick me up at midnight (laughs) yes absolutely and you're right it's so important to eat I actually feel that a lot of the time people are so excited and particularly this year we're so excited to be out to be dressed up to be seeing people people need to remember they need to put food into those little bellies of theirs (laughs) absolutely I mean that's the best part of um coming together it is you're right eating and drinking and and good company now I wanted to touch on your book because Saturday Night Pasta was released in 2020 a very appropriate time for for home cooks uh what was the reception to your book? I mean, I certainly saw it and it, gosh, just all the photography, all of the recipes, it just makes you hungry, but it also just makes you almost feels like a bit of a warm hug. And how was it received? Oh, thank you. Look, it was received really well. And I was super nervous about it because for me, I'd sort of discovered the power um, of carving some time out for yourself and cooking and, you know, cooking just for you about three years ago and it was a time that I was I was going through a really anxious period and I was struggling to find ways to cope and I just fell into making pasta and that whole meditation and kneading and channeling something, you know, like a really shitty week into the dough and then going through that process, um, you know, and then you end with this delicious meal that you can sit down and enjoy for yourself. So I sort of had discovered that about three years and I found that really helped me. And I think 2020 was a, obviously a difficult year. You know, the pandemic set foot and we all were forced to, you know, be in lockdown and, and mentally that was a really hard thing for people um, to deal with and, and it still is. Um, so I think it came at a good time as a way for people that, you know, it wasn't a straight yoga or, a, you know, a meditation and that maybe that was a hard thing for people to approach. It was kind of doing it through something else um, and something that was completely different to that in a, in a sense. Um, so I think people really, it was really, it was received really well and actually much more than I thought. Um, and I was really nervous putting that kind of message out there about, Um, those, you know, everyday anxieties and that I was kind of going through because, you know, I wondered how people would take that. Um, And so many people said to me, I had no idea. And it was great to have that conversation because the amount of messages I get and still get of people saying, I really connected to that sentiment and, um, you know, there's it, it's that ordinary, everyday, um, you know, pace of life um, that, that it's great to have the conversation that it can be it can be really difficult and to find a way of dealing with it that's maybe not, you know, that you wouldn't ordinarily connect and think about doing um, and and finding that that activity or that moment that's just for yourself. And for me, that was pasta making and in a sense cooking really. Um, so it was really nice that people picked that up and, and found that too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what I like about what you all just said is that, you know, we do have this pace of life that we go through and not not always do we have time to sit down and necessarily meditate, but if we can have that presence and that kind of tuning out, doing something that still is part of life, um, I think that we can just be healthier individuals. And, uh, you know, I think hopefully a lot of people did when they're in lockdown, find those little nuances that they could use that said, actually, I'm going to make room for this when everything starts back up again. I'm going to make room in my life for this because it's been so rewarding now. So um, I I think the book is so beautiful and, um, yeah, and I think I can totally understand why it has reached so many people. And and even your social media, Saturday Night Pasta, 
is um, massive. I mean, it, it, every week I feel see people, you know, getting on board and uh, uh, it's been pretty huge. Uh, I mean, it just fills my cup seeing people make, you know, on their Saturday night pasta journeys. And, um, you know, for me, it was really important to have that conversation and to, you know, find that, I guess, it, in a sense, that meditation really is what we're talking about, but just not in the way people always think about it and so watching people go on that journey and the the complete joy it brought it brings people um and you know not only is it the process but the end result too of this delicious bowl of pasta and I think making pasta doesn't have those pressure points that baking does for instance um you know will it rise or the right temperature and you know pasta making can be really straightforward and you know sure it might not be restaurant or award-winning pasta but at the end of the day it really doesn't matter because it'll be just as delicious for you and i think seeing people discover that has been really special yeah there's so much pride in that it's so well said I think with um, some of the roles that we have, uh, especially in um, kind of restaurants, uh, a lot of there's a lot of misconception around kind of what people do. What is you know kind of the most rewarding part of your job in creative communications? And can you tell us a little bit about kind of your day to day life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, the best part. I mean, I, it's just a real privilege for me to tell stories um, about our restaurants and our people and the producers, that is what gets me out of bed. And I love storytelling. And, you know, comms and marketing is is an opportunity to share what, you know, for our restaurants, what makes um, them really special. Um, and I feel enormously privileged to work with the people I do and the chefs I do and, and all the sommeliers I do and all the front of house, you know, that's what makes those stories really unique. So as head of creative for Fink, my job is, I mean, basically I'm across every creative decision that happens um, across those restaurants and, a day to day, it's very different. I mean, it could go from catching up with, um, you know, one of the chefs and discussing what's new, what's coming down, who are they working with, um, what stories can we tell, um, to looking ahead and planning and strategizing for the year, which, you know, in the last two years is next to impossible. Um, so, so it's also then being agile and being able to respond because restaurant marketing is not like traditional you know other industries where you can be pretty well planned you know restaurants to a point and it always has been you've had to be quite agile and respond to you know what's happening how are people eating how are people dining and looking ahead at those you know trends and then going okay how are we going to respond to that with being you know and being leaders in the industry as well so it's a very um you know, I guess fast paced job um, and fast paced industry. And it can look completely different because it could be yeah, having conversations with those people. It could be being in venue and seeing it for myself because sometimes I get down there and, you know, no one's told me about something just because they haven't, you know, felt that maybe it wasn't, you know, relevant. And then you sit down there and you go, wow, that's really special. Um, so then it could be sending out and, you know, connecting media and telling people about it and showcasing our, our venues as well. Um, yeah. And a lot of communication, a lot of um, stakeholder management um, in my position. Mm. I mean, you've been working for Fink for around 12 years, which is incredible. What are, What's your advice for people that want to get involved or enter your world of communications marketing? It's passion. You know, for me, um, you can learn, uh, you know, everything you need to learn from, from good people, but it's to have a passion. I mean, my I had my first experience at Key. Um, I was working for a PR agency and they took me along to the meeting and 
Pete was doing a menu tasting and this was before, um, you know, Key had really hit the big time. It was definitely well-known and well-received and Peter was doing some amazing things. Maybe he was at Key for, for two years at the time and we went in there and, uh, no, he would have been longer actually now I think about it, but we went into the restaurant and he was, you know, put these dishes in front of me and I just, rem- you know, I was 20 maybe um, and my mind was blown. I mean, I just had never experienced anything like it. And I remember the moment um, he put down this dessert and you know the dessert I'm going to talk about, but he put down this dessert in this beautiful Riedel glass and he, it was the snow egg and I'd never tasted anything like it. I mean, the texture, the, I'm a big custard fan too. So <laughs> it was just, you know, the, the, the flavors and that, that kind of, um, that whole, you know, the cold with the, with the custard and the crisp shell, it was just mind blowing. And for me, you know, I was, sitting there at this table looking at the Sydney Harbour Bridge with this beautiful service and each time someone brought something along they would explain, you know, a story about it and then there was Pete was bringing, actually it would have been Amanda bringing wines and saying which one does everyone like and, you know, I'm sitting there having no idea and just in awe of the whole experience and I just fell in love with fine dining and hospitality at that very moment and I thought I want to work in this industry Um and yet from then it was just it was just yeah love at first sight first bite rather and that's sort of how I you know I was in comms and marketing and really you can apply that to any any industry you want and I thought no I'm going to follow down this hospitality and and food world and I just threw myself into everything um that I could to to get better and learn and and improve my um yeah knowledge but also palate and and understanding and trying to get in people's minds because I think that makes me you know a better storyteller. Absolutely it does and Pete definitely has that effect. I can completely understand. But Lizzie, I've been telling people that come into the restaurant all the time lately that the snow egg was absolutely rubbish and they'd never they never need to miss it. So now we've gone the other way. <laughs> Sorry. But I mean luckily all of Pete's desserts are mind blowing, really. <laughs> I mean true. you can't go wrong. <laughs> So, so true. Uh, what are you see? What are the trends that you're seeing at this time of the year? I mean, restaurants are, you know, it, incredibly busy. What are you seeing, kind of, that's you know happening, or anything that you're noticing at, uh, at this particular time when you're dining out? Any trends? You know, yeah, I, I just feel people are happy to be there, and there's a real pleasure in spending time at a restaurant, and I think you know, particularly. I'm really grateful to front of house staff and, you know, that are dealing with um, customers and it's a real joy um, having those conversations and then, you know, the, the, all the, the waiters and they're just filled with excitement telling you about a dish and that's something I've just noticed um, a lot lately when dining out is everyone has time for you, even in this madness of the Christmas rush. I really feel that you know, whether it's the waiter or the sommelier, people are taking the time to explain something or answer your questions or tell you something interesting about a producer or why they love that dish or why they love that wine match. And I think for me um, that's a really, a really incredible thing because there's obviously a lot of pressure and stress with everything going on um, that there's, there's still the joy in that, which is why I love hospitality. Um, so yeah, I'm noticing a lot of that. Yeah, I totally agree. There is a a sense of, um, we haven't done this for so long and, and, you know, isn't it just great to, to be in this new phase where we are, uh, going outside the house and, and, and meeting up with people. But this time of the year is, you know, there's so much, um, anticipation around kind of Christmas and New Year's, but then there, like you said, there is this moment where we just get into summer and things you know, slow down a little bit, or we certainly hope they slow down a little bit. What does this, what represents kind of the summertime for you? You know, like if you closed your eyes and thought about kind of the January, February part of your life, what, what kind of invokes that for you? A lot of pottering. Um, I love just going down to my local, you know, butcher or my fruit and veg shop or the markets and just meandering and deciding, oh, wow, that looks really good. I'm going to take that and I'm just going to head home and do something with it. And there's no pressure. You know, sometimes 
the you know pre Christmas rush you're entertaining. So you're always you know I've got to cook this. You've got to be highly organized. But for me, January and February is just this moment of just pottering and cooking what you like and what looks good. And hey, what are you doing? Do you want to come over for lunch? Like it's so less planned, and mm. you know it, it's more casual and and relaxing. And I think it's always a nice start to the year. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. You know, those days where you kind of wander up to the shops and you go, oh, I might buy some flowers for myself or I might wander into this little pokey store that I don't know, I have no need to be in, but it's kind of nice and uh, afternoon naps. I mean, that's kind of the things that that I'm hoping for in January. I don't know if it always happens, um, but it's such a nice idea. (laughs) And I also feel it's, you know, because people haven't booked up so much that you can be chatting to a friend and they're like, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? You know, and then you all join and then a lunch turns into a dinner that turns, you know, there's just this freedom (laughs) and um, fluidity that I really, you know, for me, that's January for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you, and it is a bit putting you on the spot, but is there, you know, for me, summer and and this time of the year, I can almost taste them in in or or smell them in the in the way that I re- remember this time, especially as a child and 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 now um, in my life now. So, is there three aromas or flavors that really represent this kind of time of the year for you? Yes, I mean it's and they're probably all food related, but the first one is most definitely panettone. I mean, I just, I, I mean, I just wish I was Italian and obviously I've spent quite a lot of time in Italy um, and for me that smell of panettone is this, yeah, this year it's captured. Um, so, because, and that's something I try and have for breakfast a lot. I buy a couple um, and I'll grill them in hot butter with my cup of coffee sitting on in the sun on a little deck. Um, that's very much this time of year. I would also say the smell of tomatoes and the vines. I just, yeah, uh, oh, I just love it. And it's something I will, you know, I'll hunt. Tomatoes are just really good this time of year. And my little fruit and veg shop, Galoot Sows in Glebe, just have the best ones. And, you know, I toss them. I just, I do a raw tomato pasta a lot um, and toss them chopped up through hot, Um, pasta with basil and some goat's cheese and olive oil and it's just the best Um, and then I would probably say maybe pine needles just that we always have fresh fresh Christmas trees and just that lingering smell when you enter a house Um, and particularly after Christmas you know they're sort of they're not as vibrant as, you know, in mid-December, but they're still there and they're kind of a bit more dried. And yeah, that that's probably the three smells that remind me of this time of year. You're so good at explaining those. I love that. It's so invoking. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned the panettone because I have been given panettones and I never know what to do with it. I'm like, what do I do with this? And I've eaten it kind of just out of the box. I eat it out of the box, obviously. I always um, do that. And then just fried in butter for breakfast is just another level. Um, I sometimes actually New Year's Eve, and that's what I did for that midnight New Year's Eve um, feast, is I made panettone bread and butter pudding, um, which is just so indulgent. (laughs) You know, anything with custard. Um, And gosh, yeah, I mean, I just nibble it all. I just can't get sick of it. Um, puddings, just just tipped custard on top is pretty good too. Okay, that's <laughs> what I'm doing then. This this I'm going to make, I'm going to get a panettone and I'm going to make custard. I'm just going to drown it in custard. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, good. yeah that's exactly right. <laughs> oh, Lizzie, thank you for spending some time with me today. It's so nice for the roles to be a little reverse and for me to ask questions of you. I hope that we get a chance to clink glasses sometime soon, but thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, I could talk to you all day long um, and just lovely to, to spend some time with you. Oh, it was such a delight. Thank you so much. I know it feels different roles reversed, um, but always a pleasure catching up with you. Wish it was over a glass of wine, but soon. Definitely soon. I I will uh, hold you to that. Thanks again, Lizzie, and have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. 
follow us on Instagram at overaglasspod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.